And I, I've been reading in Joshua some, and so I want to go back to Joshua this morning, chapter 2. So if you would turn there. And we're going to talk about a story that you've all heard many, many times. <clears throat> but it's one that, that needs to be talked about. It's one that we can learn a lot of lessons from. Before we go there, I want to ask a question. Have you ever made a stand for something and then all of a sudden found out you were standing alone? You know, you finally made a decision to stand for something and you're standing for it and this is, this is what I believe and you find out that nobody else is standing with you. Is that, that's kind of an uncomfortable place to be, isn't it? Sometimes it is, but let me tell you something. If we're standing for what's right, it ought not to be uncomfortable. If we're standing for what's right, it ought to be a blessing. It will be a blessing if we're standing for what's right. You know, you, you study church history. There was a guy by the name of Athanasius, okay, who was a bishop in the church very early. I think he was born in, uh, I don't know, something like two... 92 or 295, something like that, and he lived to 373. So for his day, he lived a long life, okay? And he was a bishop in the church. And you know what? There was this debate going on within the church. There was this debate about the deity of Christ. You know what? We, we have been arguing this thing for I don't know how long. It ain't that hard, people. Read the book. The book said that Jesus was God. He was a deity. And let me tell you something else. It also says, and this is common sense, you can figure this out, that if Christ was not God, then His death on the cross meant nothing. But because He was God, it means that we have eternal life. We ought to be happy about that. But Athanasius, he stood for what was right and he stood for the deity of Christ. Now let me tell you, he was standing alone in that issue. Nobody else would stand with him. Let me tell you something. Every emperor that came along during his day denounced him because of the stand that he took on the deity of Jesus Christ. They denounced him. The church actually took his position away from him several times. And they always wound up giving it back. But he was standing alone and he stood alone for his whole life on the deity of Christ. And you know what? In the end, he was victorious. You know why? Because he stood for what was right. Folks, you stand for what's right. You stand for the truth of God no matter what. You know, it is amazing to me how many people will get on television and they'll start running ads about how they are a fundamental Christian, that they are, they believe in the Word of God, and they stand on the Word of God, and they say this to get elected, and then they get up there and they throw the Bible out the window on the way. We need people to stand up. You know what? The reason we're in the mess we're in nowadays is because people quit standing up for Jesus Christ. And for the Word of God, you stand for what's right. The story in the Bible in Joshua chapter 2 today is about a person who stood for God and His truth and it paid off in a big way. And it's the story of Rahab. And you know what? Rahab, and we're going to learn a lot about her. Rahab had a profession that most people look down on. She was a prostitute. Okay? And she lived in Jericho among the Amorites. We're going to learn a little bit about the Amorites today, too. Let me tell you something. This is a person that you would think, wait a minute, she's a prostitute, she's an Amorite, she's a Gentile. How in the world could she stand up for the truth of God? I'll tell you how. Let me tell you something. She'd never heard of Jesus. It was way before Jesus' time. Okay? Christ had not come yet. We're going to talk about that today, too. Oh, boy, it's good how God works. She had never heard of Jesus. She didn't have a Bible. There wasn't any Bibles around. She couldn't read about the Word of God. She didn't have a preacher come and preach about God to her. But she had heard about the God of Israel. She had heard about Him. And she believed in Him. And she trusted Him. And she made a stand for Him. 
Now we're going to go through just a little bit of the story and then I'm going to read starting in verse 9. Joshua was in command now. God said, okay, you're fixing to cross Jordan and the first place you're going to is Jericho. So send two spies to Jericho to spy it out. And so they sent the two spies and guess where the two spies wound up? They wound up in the house of Rahab, didn't they? Alright. And she hid them. She hid them from all the other Amorites from the king. She hid them. Because what would have happened had they been found? They'd have killed them. Okay? And she hid those spies. And before they went to sleep that night up on the roof of her house, she went up there and she wanted to talk to them. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Stand with me as we start reading in verse 9 of chapter 2 of Joshua. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Now right off the bat, she makes a pretty strong pronouncement there. She says, I know. There was no ambiguity in her mind at all. She said, I know that God has given you this land. And I know... Uh, and that the terror is fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. They were scared and the Israelites hadn't even got there yet. Verse 10 says, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. In other words, they had to destroy some nations on the other side of Jordan before they actually got into the promised land. Word spreads quick. Verse 11 said, And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Folks, that's from a person that was a heathen to the rest of the world. That's from a person who had just heard about God, but realized He is God, not just in heaven, but also in earth. And she says, Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness under my Father's house and give me a true token and that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. Wow. This from a woman who was worthless to society. But she wasn't worthless to God. Amen. Father, help us to understand that, Lord, it doesn't matter what the world thinks about us or what we think about anybody else. What matters is what You think and whom You can use. Father, I pray that You would help us to understand the truths that You want us to know from this story. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would move in a special way for us in your name we pray. Amen. The first thing we need to look at is the spies. You notice that Joshua only sent two spies. Now you remember 40 years earlier they sent 12 spies. They sent a spy from every one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And what happened? When they got back after spying out the land, now this was 40 years earlier, Moses had the people at the, the Jordan River and they were getting ready to go in and God said, send in spies. And so they sent in spies and 10 of the spies, 10 of the 12 came back and they said, there ain't no way we can take this. Those people are giants. They are prepared for wars. No way we can do it. But guess what? Two of those spies came back and said, what is the problem? God's already delivering them to us. There were only two of them that were looking at it from God's point of view. God had said, I've already given you this land. What are you afraid of? And because of the disobedience of those spies and the unbelief, those people wandered around in the wilderness for another 40 years until that generation had died off. But now Joshua's got him. He said, you know what? This time we're just going to send two spies. 
And so they sent two spies into Jericho. Now they had not crossed the Jordan River yet. They were still on the other side, but he's doing a little prep work and he says, I want you to go over there to Jericho and I want you to bring me back some intelligence about this. You come back and let me know what it's going to be like when we get there. Now, do you think that really was the reason that God wanted Joshua to send spies? May have been. But you know what? Here's the thing. God had already promised a long time ago to Abraham that he was going to give this land to the people. Did they really need intelligence? All they needed to do was trust God and go do it. And God was going to take care of it, and God did take care of it. Folks, they didn't have to have intelligence, so why in the world did the two spies go over there? I like this. It's because there was a woman there that everybody else looked down on, and God said, let me tell you something, she's one of mine, and she needs saving. That's why he did it. Folks, that's why the spies went in there. It's because Rahab and her family needed saving from the Israelites when they came in there. Let me tell you something. You think I'm crazy. Look at John chapter 4 sometime and read through it. What did Jesus tell his disciples when they were headed back to Jerusalem? He said, I must needs go through Samaria. You stop and think about that. Samaria was a place that the Jews wanted nothing to do with. They were an unclean nation according to the Jews. The Jews would go a hundred miles away. They, do, they would do Samaria like I do Atlanta. I'll go a hundred miles around Atlanta to keep from going into Atlanta. Okay? But they would go around. They wouldn't go through Samaria, but Jesus told the disciples, I have to go through Samaria. Why? Because there was a woman that he was going to meet there, a Samaritan woman that needed Savior. Jesus knew where she was going to be. And Jesus said, we got to go through there. And you know what the odd thing is? This woman was a prostitute as well. Oh, folks, we get so hung up on these bad sins. And I'm not making excuses. I'm not saying it's good. But folks, let me tell you something. God sees sin. He doesn't put a level on it like we do. God just sees sin. But God also sees hearts. And God also sees people that need saving. And He don't care what they do. And He don't care what their sin is. If they need it, God's going to be where they are when He needs to be. And I'm thankful for that. Because He was where I needed Him to be. He knew where I was going to be. And He knew what I needed. And He came to me. And folks, let me tell you something. I'm no better than any of these people in this scripture. I'm no better, and neither are you. Folks, we're just sinners that are saved. That's all in the world we are. Amen. It doesn't make us better than anybody else. It just makes us saved. And I'm happy about that. Folks, let me tell you something. Jesus said we got to go through Samaria. God said, you send those spies because I got somebody in there that needs saving. God had been working on Rahab's heart even though she had just heard about it. And you know what? This is her story. But it's more than her story. This is a story of the grace of God. God's grace, folks, it's about His mercy, not His wrath. Let me tell you something. There is a place and there is a time when we need to be preaching about God's wrath. And we need to be telling people about God's wrath. You know, I've already visited that some when we were going through Romans and everything. But folks, let me tell you something. We need to be telling people out there, yeah, He's got a wrath, but His mercy is greater. His mercy is greater. His grace is greater. It's greater than all our sin. I love that song. Grace. This is a story about God's grace. Look. You read in here about the Amorites and you read about their what kind of country they were and what kind of sin they had. Let me tell you something. God had already <coughs> judged these people. Do you remember the story of the flood in the Bible? God actually said, it, I, am, I, I regret having created man because they have become so wicked and He said, I'm going to destroy all of them except Noah and his family. And that's when He told Noah to start building a boat. 
And so Noah was safely built the boat and it rained and God destroyed everything on this earth except what was in that ark. And that was Noah and his family and the animals that they had in there. Okay? God had made that same decision about the Amorites and the occupants of Jericho. He said their sin is so bad and it is so vile, it is so gross that I'm going to destroy every one of them. But because of God's grace and because Rahab had heard about him and trusted in him and, and admitted that he was the one true God, God said that one gets saved and her whole family. And so they sent the two spies. And so God's grace could be known. God said, look, I'm going to destroy all of them, but I'm going to save the harlot that lives there because she trusts me. Mm. So I'm thinking about Rahab for a minute. Would she really fit in with the Israelites? I mean, she was a Gentile. That's the first thing we know about her. She was a Gentile. Okay? But look, I look at that and I don't see that there's a big difference there. I see this. I see this as God giving us a picture of what is to come. What did God say? What did Paul say? Paul, when he was teaching, said, look, yeah, salvation is through the Jews, but it's offered to everybody. Look, Israel thought they had a lock on God. They thought that God was just their God and wouldn't be God to anybody else. What they didn't understand was that God is the God of everything and everybody. They thought they were privileged. And you know what? They were because God chose them. Come on. That is a privilege. But God also chooses those who come to Him in faith. And Rahab had done that. She was a Gentile but she trusted in God. Folks, listen. She wasn't the only one. You look in Scripture, who else can we find? You go on down a little ways, you read the story about Ruth, don't you? Ruth was a Moabite. Moabites weren't Israelites. According to the Israelites, they were Gentiles as well. They were on the outside of this salvation thing too. They were on the outside of this God thing. But God had other plans for Ruth, didn't He? Because God trusted I mean, Ruth trusted in the God of the Israelites. Go on and look at Naaman. Naaman was a Syrian. Do the Jews and the Syrians get along real well these days? They never had. But guess what? When God gets in there, you start getting along with people you didn't get along with before, don't you? Naaman was a Syrian. Folks, let me tell you something. She was a Gentile but she was God's. She was a Gentile. She was an Amorite. Folks, I don't know if you know anything about the Amorites, but they were just vile people. <laughs> they were wicked. God said their wickedness was horrible and God had already passed judgment on them because of their wickedness. They were vile. You know what the greatest sin that God pointed out to them was? That they sacrificed their own children to false God. Does that ring a bell? I'm just saying, does it ring a bell? Folks, let me tell you something. I used to read stories, you know, when I was younger in the Bible, and I was like, man, these people had the world. God, God needed to destroy these people. And I look at our country nowadays and I'm thinking, God be merciful because we deserve to be destroyed for what we have done in this country, for not standing up for God for not standing up for what is right. <coughs> Folks, let me tell you something. She was a Gentile. She was an Amorite. She didn't have a lot going for her. And they had all that. Now, all, on top of all that, she was a prostitute. <laughs> Some theologians think she had already left the prostitute uh, profession by this time because they said, well, she hid the spies among flax up on a rooftop and that meant that, you know, that she was working with flax and everything. She was making things to sell so she had gotten out of it. But I just don't think that's the case. When those two spies came in, where could they go? Because people saw them and people didn't recognize them. People didn't recognize them. But apparently nobody went and talked to them. But where did they go? Where's the first place they went? They went to Rahab's house. 
you know what? That was a good move. And I'm not saying that they were immoral in any way. I'm just saying nobody suspected a thing since they went there. It was a good move. And guess what? God told them to go there. You know why God told them to go there? Because she's the one they needed to see. That's why. You know what? God tells you to go talk to somebody. Hey, go. Because God's already prepared. Because there's a need there that, that they have that God wants to use you to help meet. Folks, that's why we do this. That's why we ask Christ to come in our hearts so we can serve Him. And folks, if you're not willing to serve, if you're not willing to go where God wants you to go, and I'm going to say this, and heaven help me, God knows my heart. <laughs> if God told me to go to Atlanta, I'd go. <laughs> folks, let me tell you something. God knew that Rahab needed those spies there. He also knew it was good cover for them. People wouldn't ask a lot of questions, would they? But Rahab took them up on the roof and she hid them. And she hid them among the flax up there that she had stacked. And so the king found out that there were two spies that had come in. And what'd she do? He called for Rahab and said, hey, these two spies came to your house. She didn't lie about that. She said, no. Uh, she said, yeah, they came. And he said, where are they? She said, they already left. And she told the field about that, didn't she? Because they were on her roof hiding. And she took a lot of risks that we're going to talk about. But folks, let me tell you something. She was an immoral person. So was the Samaritan woman. But she was no worse than me. Not at all. God can save anybody. Amen. God can save anybody. <coughs> Folks, she had heard about God. What does the Bible say about hearing? It brings faith. Doesn't it? Hearing brings faith. She had heard that the God of Israel, but how did she hear about it? There was no news media back then. You couldn't turn on the 6 o'clock news. I don't turn it on anymore anyway. You know? There was no news media. There was no radio. There was no... How did she hear about it? How did she hear about what God had done for the Israelites going all the way back to Egypt? She said, look, we heard how He dried up the Red Sea for y'all to go across. That's a pretty big deal, right? They had heard about that. And guess what? That had happened 40 years before. Probably more than 40 it had happened a long time ago, but they had heard about it. They had heard about it. How did she hear? She said, we heard how you conquered nations and utterly destroyed those kings on the other side of the Jordan River. We heard about that. How did she hear about that? You know how she heard about it? And this is one reason I don't think she had left the profession yet. The customers. The people who frequented her home would talk about what they had heard about the God of Israel. And you know what? I can only imagine this based on what she says in chapter 2 of Joshua. She says this, that when we heard, our hearts melted, our courage was gone. They were literally shaking in their sand. They were scared of the God of Israel. Folks, listen. She had heard with her ears. But more importantly, more importantly, she heard with her heart. Folks, let me tell you something. We can hear with our ears all day long and not, and not grasp what we're hearing. It's only when we hear with our heart that it makes a difference. When we hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only with our ears, but with our heart, that's when faith grows. That's when salvation comes. And God knew that Rahab had not only heard with her ears, but she also heard it in her heart. She had taken it to heart. And God said, you are being saved because of this. It was her faith that saved, saved her. She hid those spies. 
You know what? James, if you read the book of James, James talks about Rahab. There's two other times in Scripture that Rahab's mentioned. One of them's in James. What does James talk about? Y'all remember? Most people say the tongue. Well, yeah, he talks about the tongue. But he also talks about this. This is the one people miss. He talks about putting some feet to your prayer. He talks about your faith being a faith that works. Okay? Works don't bring faith. Faith brings works. And James talks about that. And when he talks about Rahab, you know what he was saying? You know what? She had faith. But she put that faith in action when she hid the spies. And folks, you don't understand, she was taking a great risk. She was risking her life. Because if the king had found out about her deception, if the king had found out that she was even entertaining those spies and, and assisting them, then she would have been killed. They would have put her to death. They probably would have tortured her really bad first. But get this, there was more than just her life at risk they would have also gotten her whole family. Now, she wasn't married. She didn't have a husband, but she had a mom and a daddy and brothers and sisters because she tells us that. Okay, they would have gotten her whole family and they would have slaughtered them as well. They would have killed them. And they would have killed Rahab. She was taking a huge risk by doing what she did. Did she consider it a risk? Not at all. She considered it standing for what's right. She looked at it as standing for the truth of God. And she was willing to risk everything because she was willing to stand up for God and trust Him. Are we willing to trust Him with our lives? I mean, we've already trusted Him with our eternal life, right? With our soul. Why shouldn't we trust Him with our earthly life? This body. Why, why shouldn't we trust Him with that? Folks, Rahab had already done that. She was willing to take the risk. She hid the spies. Her faith, she put works to her faith. It was faith in action. And she risked her life. But she gave up the people that she was from. She said, I'm willing to deny them for God. Are you willing to do that? She gave up her own country. You know why she did that? Because she realized as did everybody else in the city of Jericho, they realized this, that when Israel came, that no one would survive. God had commanded them to do what? Kill all of them. Kill men, women, children, kill the cattle, kill the dogs, kill the cats, kill them all. They knew that no one would be given quarter. They knew that everyone would die unless they were Allege, uh, they, they pledge their allegiance to the God of Israel. Rahab said that I'm going to forsake the people from where I come for the new people of God. You know what? In a spiritual sense, we have to do that. Sometimes in a very literal physical sense, we have to do that. You talk to a Jewish, or to many Jewish people who are Messianic Jews now, who believe in Christ, a lot of times, those people who are Messianic Jews will tell you that their families have forsaken them <coughs> and disowned them because of the stand they take for Jesus Christ. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing? Talk to a Muslim. <laughs> Gets a little more extreme with a Muslim. You take a Muslim person who accepts Jesus Christ, not only are they disowned and done away with by their family, but and when I say done away with, they try to kill them. If they don't get to safety, they will be killed because of Christ. And the day may come where we as Christians face that same threat. Are we willing to stand for what's right? Rahab was willing. She identified with Israel. She was accepted as Israelite. Let me tell you something. This is the best part of the whole story, right? Here. It's the best part of it. Now remember, she's a prostitute. She is an immoral person. She is a person that the world looks down on. But you know what? She told those spies, I believe in your God, and I want to side with you, and I want to join your people and worship your God, but I want to be saved here. And so they told her, 
yes, you will be saved. She was saved. Her and her family, they came to no harm. Okay? And they were accepted into Israel. Now, the Israelites didn't treat them as second class citizens. They accepted them fully. You know, there were some, there were some uh, tribes that Israel defeated that they kept around to, to be servants to them. You know, they, they could have said, okay, we'll save you, but you'll be our servant. No, no, no. They didn't do that. They said, you are accepted as one of us. And let me tell you just how far they went in this. Rahab wound up getting married. And she wound up marrying a man named Solomon. Okay? And she and Solomon actually had children. And they had a son. You know what their son's name was? It was Boaz. Do you know what Boaz did? He wound up marrying Ruth. He married a Gentile woman too, didn't he? But it was one that God had put there for him. And you know what? They got married and they had children. And so Rahab and Boaz, they had a son who was named Obed. And Obed grew up and he got married. And he had a son named Jesse. And Jesse grew up and got married and he had a son named David. King David. The greatest king earthly that Israel ever had. His great grandma was a prostitute. But she was a saved one. She was a saved prostitute. And guess what? You keep reading the list. And guess what David was? He was one of the great granddaddies of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Amen. Folks, let me tell you something. You think, you think Rahab was a second-hand citizen? No, let me tell you something. God had saved her. God knew her heart. God knew where she was. And God put her in the line of the Savior of the world. That's grace. That's grace. But I also think it's important that we mention this. How in the world did they know when the Israelite army went in there and they walked around the city for seven days quiet and then they walked around it on the seventh day uh, seven times and on the last time around they shouted and blew the horns and the walls came tumbling down and they just run right over the rubble and they took care of everybody. How did they know to save Rahab and her family. Because the spies have said, you get all of your family in your house and you tie this red rope in your window. And that's going to be the sign that lets us know they're safe. Red and white was a red rope. <laughs> you stop, stop thinking about that. Why was it a red rope? It was the rope that she had let the spies down out of her window with. You know what? It kind of reminds me of when they left Egypt. The night before they left Egypt, what they had to do? They had to put blood on the doorpost, didn't they? And now we see another picture of salvation where there's a red rope hanging in the window. Let me tell you something. I don't think it's any secret that's the blood of Christ. But listen, I think about this and I get plumb excited. Folks, let me tell you something. Theologians talk about the scarlet thread that runs through history. And if you study dispensationalism, you see the scarlet thread of the blood of Christ that runs down through history to the time of Christ. Let me tell you something. I don't think it's any coincidence at all that that rope was red. The blood on the doorpost is what saved the firstborn of the Israelites and allowed them to leave the next day. The red cord that sim symbolizes the blood of Christ is what saved those spies as they got out the window and got outside the wall and got away so that they could go back and tell everybody this woman and her family is supposed to be saved. But that same cord also is the reason that she was saved. Folks, let me tell you something. You can't get away with it. I don't care what any theologian says. There's only one way of salvation and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's all. That's all. It's the only way. Folks, let me tell you something. Thank God for the blood of Christ. Thank God 
for what it represents. Let me tell you something. We're just as corrupt and vile as Rahab. But the blood of Christ changes that. Thank God. Let me tell you something. I think it's time that we ask God to renew in our spirit the excitement that we should have because we are covered and saved by the blood of Christ and ask God for the courage to stand up for what is right, for the truth of God, and make a difference where we are. Father, we pray today that, Lord, You would help us to be the servants that You want us to be. Heavenly Father, I thank You for the blood. I thank You, Heavenly Father, that it covers me. I thank You, Lord, that You... You reach down to me, a vile, corrupt sinner, and you save my soul. I praise you for that. I thank you for that. Help me to be willing to stand for the truth of the blood of Jesus Christ. And Father, may we all. Lord, I just pray that in this time you would have your will and your way and that you would be glorified. For it's in your precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. We're